Welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. My guest today has lived music as a profession. When there were places to play and cats could get loose on the bandstand with Charles Tolliver or Jimmy and Tootie Heath. Late shows with Woody Shaw and long before our mothers cried with Sonny Fortune. My guest is awash in all musics and drunk with sound. He has dealt with good leadership and bad, has come to different understandings of what love is, and has overcome a lot of adversity in his life. It is all music and labels and names have really gotten in the way of our ability to create communal, spiritual music. The bean counters want to pigeonhole and brand music. We've gotten to a point now in our society where you go to a blues festival and there's not one black band. Or you go to a jazz festival and it's just a bunch of R&B bands. My guest today is a conduit for information coming through him from the heavens. He had a chance to play with the original masters of the music and learn to get out of his own way and become part of the musical conversation. Life is not always peaceful, especially if you're a professional artist. You have to know your instrument, hone your sound, be a, ba- be a leader and a teammate at the same time, and find places to play that believe in the profession of music. That it's not a pay-to-play game. That music is to be felt and is not for pacification. You need to burn and go beyond the atmosphere because we'll be leaving this planet for other worlds. Roger Humphreys, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Thank you, Jake. You know, I wanted to talk to you uh, growing up, whether it was J.C. Moses, the Turrentine Brothers, Ahmad Jamal, Johnny Costa, whoever it was. Did you guys use labels when you were talking about music? Well, when you say labels, what do you mean by labels? I mean, like, uh, you know, jazz, for instance. I mean, that that term has been bastardized. Me and you could walk down the street of Pittsburgh together and get ask people what their definition of the word jazz is and get 20 different answers. And uh, I just feel like terminology in general has really stifled the ability to create new musical vocabulary. You guys were just... I don't care if it was Booker or Irvin. I, I just wonder how you referred, if you just referred to it as music itself, or were were you in fact involved with a brand labeling the music? Well, jazz is a is a is a certain style of music. Put it that way, even though it can cover all uh, genres of uh, different music. But when we think about jazz, we think about being able to express ourselves think about all the people that came before me, all the people that I've gotten lessons from, not even in person, but through the music. And jazz has a style, you know, it's without words, I can't explain it, you know. Oh, I did. That much in definition, that much in the definition but it, it just got its own style. What would, when you say it's got its own sound, uh, for the lay person out there, I couldn't ask a better person, you, got, you came up literally in one of the most gleaming periods of of extensions of musical vocabulary. What is that sound, Roger? Well, what about the term of, like, being smooth, okay? You know, uh, and they even have a, a term now that they call smooth jazz. <laughs> Unfortunately, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I'm talking about when we play in uh, pieces like Cherokee, uh, 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 Night and Day, uh, uh, down by Clifford Brown, Max mm-hmm. Roach, you know, mm-hmm. one by one and those kind of things. That's under the category, you know, when you think about the the, the great jazz the songs and stuff like that with Louis Armstrong who came up with. Can you talk about a lesson that you got from somebody that wasn't even in person, but, or, uh, you know, maybe it was just through the radio or, you know, ultimately... Cats like Vernel Fournier. Who were who were some of your mentors that you may never even have necessarily met, but well, they they taught you stuff. My, I had uh, two particular mentors because they had chance. I had chance to, to watch them and listen to them play all the time, and that was at the uh, Crawford Grill. Yeah. And I met I met Art Blakey as a young kid because he knew my uncle Frank and my uncle Hildred, and like um, man. <laughs> he would uh, he would come to the Crawford Girl just thinking about it and listen to him. One of the one of the things I I had um 
I didn't have any problem doing, but I had to listen to him play that drum roll. And he could come up from silence all the way to, to bring the, the sound up, you know. Oh, oh man. Man, he was the only one that could do that, you know. He's the only one that did that. But it was it just his style, uh, basically. Uh, Art Blakey could play the blues shuffle, you know. When you say, let's play a blues, is the way he could lay back and put that, that shuffle in the, the music and make it swing so hard, you know. Not doing a lot of things, just doing that shuffle behind it. And it's one of the things I, 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 I learned from him. But it was great watching him in person, you know, because you, you learn so much more watching the person play than just by listening to them on the emotions come from it, you know, when oh. you're watching them play instead of just listening to them on the air. And... Um, my my other mentor was uh, Max Roach, because uh, when Max was playing with the band up at Clifford Brown, and they were at the uh, Crawford Grill, and um, I think that was a, I think I had a chance to see him at the, the Crawford Grill bef- just before he passed away, just before he died. You talking about Clifford think, or Max? Yeah, just b- before uh, before he passed, I had a chance to to see him. Uh, anyway, but. Listen to Max. Max always solo where he could like making a conversation in phrases, you know, like nobody else could do it, you know. And I, I learned a lot from Max Roach. And um, these guys uh, was, was doing something that I tried to do myself. <laughs> and that was like to pass it on. Sure. The music that I'm doing now to the younger generation. And one, one of the best schools in the world to me is when you get a chance to go to after the thing that you've been learning is to be able to go to a jam session and let, and let them uh, and have the opportunity to listen to the other players, you know. Man, you learn a whole lot in, uh, when you're watching people play. I just want to go back to uh, Blakey for a minute. How did he even know your uncles? Well, Art Blakey... Uh, it's from the Hill District, and my uncles, they had moved from uh, Kentucky. They were living here on the north side, on Carrington Street. Wow. <laughs> and uh, Roy Eldrick also lived, he was on the north side, up around, around uh, Charles Street. But anyway, as I didn't, I know of this, the story because I was too young to, to see them do any of this, man. But uh, they would come to Carrington Street because I was, I was born on Jefferson Street, where there's a street above it, and in the house, 225 East Jefferson Street. And I was born like in 1944. So they, Art Blakey would, I guess, come over here to the north side, wherever they met at, and they would play together. Oh, you know, so like your uncles you your uncles, <laughs> your uncles, played music too? Yeah, my Uncle Frank, uh, Fat Man Frank Humphrey, he is, he's a trumpet player. You can find him on uh, YouTube. Really? You know? Wow. Yeah, Frank Humphrey and my other uncle, um, he was a, uh, my uncle Hildred played saxophone. <laughs> yeah, man, you can look them up. Matter of fact, um, they they moved from New York City to Nyack, New York. And it's been a, a couple of musicians um, at the top of my head, I can't um, call them, but saxophone players who, who met my uncle Hildred. And uh, before, you know, and the one is in Pittsburgh because he's down there playing with a lot of other musicians. And uh, it's just been a, a great experience, man. You know, the music world that I live in, and not, not only me, musicians live in, but it, it's, it's wonderful. And, and now I get a chance to see, to see a lot of the students that I had the opportunity of, of teaching. Now I'm... <laughs> They're playing their butts off, okay? This is another phase. They're playing their, their butts off. So Let me ask you wonderful. something. Uh, uh, <coughs> I, I'm with you. I, I, I mean, I, the sincerity of the younger kids, their ability, their technique, their facility, it's amazing. But do they really have the same bandstand opportunities that you did? I mean, the, the truth is, man, besides the jam ses- sessions, I don't know when you joined the union, but I mean, you were on the bandstand six nights a week, maybe four sets a night. Uh, I mean, that to me, you're going to become, um, uh, you're going to put hair on your chest with that kind of stuff. Today, there's just such a, a supply and demand issue 
And I just wonder when you, maybe you can talk a little bit about this. I mean, when you were coming up, there was never any doubt that you were going to make a profession as a music. You were going to become a professional musician. You could make a living as a musician. Is that fair to say? Well, uh, you know, you never know. But the thing about it, this is what you do. Yeah. This is what I accept in my life to do. So therefore, like, uh, I, I worked many jobs before, you know, doing other things. And like uh, making sure that I could have enough money, you know, when, once you get grown, have a family. I work other jobs to make sure my family had what they needed. But I'm always constantly playing my music. But it'd be nice if you, uh, if anybody could write their future down and say, well, in about 10 years, I would become a millionaire playing music. No, you know? I mean, not, I mean, not, I, just, I, I mean, it just doesn't go that way. You know, no. you just keep doing what you do, playing your music and you keep on striving, you know, to get something, you know, that you, you love. And uh, I, don't, I can't explain except the fact that you're doing it, you're doing the music from the bottom of your heart and it's a profession right now. And you can get into the deal where you be making records with different people, going on the road with different people like I did with Ray Charles and, you know, Horace Silver and, and uh, Stanley Turrentine. I've been listening to a lot of Stanley lately. I mean, <clears throat> but, uh, Roger, you know, uh, when you were 18 and or just beginning to sort of get your sea legs or, you know, maybe you started when you were 14, I think, I, you know, but the fact is, you had your gig start. When was your first professional gig? When you were thirteen or fourteen years old? Well, say it was when I was fourteen. I had, you know, that was my first professional. But the other, um, when I went on the road with Stanley Turrentine, I was eighteen. I just came out of high school. At fourteen, I, I think Ahmad joined the union at ten years old. Were you ever? Were you already part of the union at fourteen? I. I, I, I can't remember. I think I, I might have been, you know, because I had to follow direction. They told me to do what I had to do. And he was other professional musician who was in the union that was on that bandstand with me at the age of 14. That was Carnegie Music Hall in, in the city of Pittsburgh. So I'm quite sure I had to have um, been part of the union. Because if not then, it was not too much longer after that. And... Yeah, so I just, uh, to me, the opportunity for you to be, um, you weren't an adult, you were swinging with your elders, your first gig was at 14, kids were in a lot of, a lot of the places to play, bars, they stayed open later, do you think it's, I guess all I'm saying is, even when you were cutting Blue Note records, you were working other gigs, or did you work gigs before you, I mean, because once you start playing with Carmel Jones, Horace Silver, I mean... You know, your name is sort of etched in stone as a pro. Did you still work j other jobs during those years? No, when I was working with uh, uh, Silver, no, just uh, with the quintet. Can you talk a little bit about how many dates a year you would go? I mean, about 250 dates a year, is that right? Uh, for the year? I mean, just Maybe when you... Was. Yeah. I can't remember that. I can't remember that for. I just know we would go on the road, like you said, for weeks. And then, uh, you know, and be off. Who was in that working group? I, I've interviewed all the guys who came afterwards. Uh, John B. Williams, Billy Cobham, Benny Maupin, uh, Randy Brecker. That was Horace's band in like 68. But wh who, was in, who was in that group, working group, when you were with Horace? Well, it was uh, Carmel Jones, Joe Henderson, Holy Teddy God. Smith on bass. Oh, my God. Myself and the horse. It was the quintet. That is such a beautiful. I cannot. We Carmel Jones, because I didn't. I yeah. thought he was he from Kansas City, wasn't he from Kansas City? Yes. So mm -hmm. how, how did he wind yeah. up in that in that band? Uh, it was beautiful. Matter of fact, this is another <laughs> part of schooling for me because yeah. these guys are older than me. You know what I mean? And it was just. Uh, it was wonderful to play with Carmel. Very, very, very nice person on top of that. Plus, he just uh, he could play the butt off. I mean, did he, like, I'm just curious about how it all came together because I, 
Carmel was in Kansas City. Then I remember seeing him on the West Coast playing bebop dates on World Pacific Jazz. But how did I guess how did that all magically come together that you wound up connecting with Horace? Well, how like uh, one of the things like uh, when people uh, select you, they select you for what they hear that you can do. You know what I mean? Sure. And and Horace is the one to select me. I went for the auditions in uh, up New York City, you know. And uh, he selected me, man, uh, you know, to be the drummer because there was other drummers also there. But at that particular time, he selected me because he, he, he thank God for the schooling that he helped gave me. <laughs> and then to be playing with, with you know, uh, Going with Carmel, Joe Henderson, Teddy Smith, and playing a different style, like you know, African cream. You know. It was uh, very good for me for my my future. You know, I mean, is it fair to say uh, maybe Blakey tipped him off about you? Did he see you at, in Pittsburgh? How did he know even know you you were swinging? <laughs> yeah, what, you mean a horse show? Yeah. Uh, let me see. I met. I met horse at the, yeah. I met horse at the Crawford Grill. Uh, Roy Brooks was his. Uh, oh my god, dude! My uh, dude, what a legend, man! Jeez, see that Roy Brooks oh, was in there, man. and I went and sat in. You dig it? But oh, I, I did with horse silver <laughs> at that time, and Roy Brooks left the band. <laughs> That's how that happened. You know. I got a call saying like, uh, Roger, I want you to come up to New York City for an audition. Got it. And. And my family lives in 770 St. Nicholas Avenue, so we went down, you know, it wasn't that far. I forget the name of the studio where they always go. But, uh, yeah, that's how I got the gig, but uh, but with Horace, you know, because there was other drummers there. I'm not naming names anything, man, because these guys, when I listened to them play, I said, damn, you, you know, kind of scary. You know, <laughs> they play so well. Yeah, man. I mean, that is, it was and, such and, a, yeah, go ahead. And then here I end up getting the gig, you know, so it made me very appreciative. Can you just talk about, as best you can remember, the sort of experience on the road? I mean, I remember speaking to Rick Laird, who passed away. He was a bass player, most notably in Mahavishnu, but orchestra, but he would, he was on the road periodically with Joe Henderson. This is when Joe was a band leader. I mean, they'd be taking trains in 16 inches of snow in Poland. They'd be playing in house in brothels and, and strip ha- clubs. And, I mean, the pay wasn't very good. You had to pay for your hotel. I know Stanley Clark, when he joined Horace, it was like such an education because Stanley was kind of, you know, jerking around a little bit. And Horace is like, if you can't get this together by Saturday, you're going to be home by Sunday. You know, it was, it, was like, it was like a real, like, serious... Can you just talk about... That road experience, maybe a a, a, a lesson, you know, the education. Well, well it's a it, it is a very good lesson. The road experience, you learn so much, and so much you can appreciate when you go back home that you couldn't do on the road. But that would be a conversation we'd be having till tomorrow if I got into this one. You well, know, maybe just one. Road. Do you have a one to fit <laughs> one? Do you have one memory of of Horace sort of sort of in, in not being? Uh, I would say mean to you but but kind of just waking you up and saying if you want you know you gotta you gotta work on this or, or just something in general that that uh that stands out in your memory as as something that you hold near and dear today yeah but the only thing he, he he looked out for me because i was like a, a young you know a little young brother to it at a point because he met my family and everybody you know right it. so he looked out for me and like uh me uh, paying attention and to like uh, uh, what he was doing, how he took care of business with the owners, you know, sometimes. And I, I just learned a lot, man. And I also learned, you know, like uh, playing. When I was playing with him, I forget where we were at, but um, for some reason or other, we weren't on the same pulse. We weren't on the right, same pulse. Right, 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 <laughs> right. And it, and it taught me it taught me something because he said, hey, man, it seemed like you, you were rushing to the temple or something. And I said, no, I, I thought, you know, I, I, thought, I felt like it was you doing it. He said, but it was you. And I, I learned 
my lesson by at that time not to say anything not to say anything anymore just keep quiet and listen to your man because you know because uh or the idea is that it, that he dictate he's the leader he dictates the tempo yeah, yeah. and it was it was nothing but afraid it was nothing right exactly yeah, I, I dig i did i did and, i did and you yeah. know something else it helps you how to follow you know not you don't have to be exactly right you can make things happen by just <laughs> Absolutely. That you guys were like classic. I mean, it was just amazing the architecture of the songs. Did you did you wrote, were you on the road like playing new material before you would go into the studio like song for my father for instance. Was that that song has such a it, there's such a soul element to it. Uh, maybe it was a first take, but had you guys been playing that live before you went in and, and cut it in the studio? Yes, I'm sure we had. Well, because, yeah. you know, that's a lot of cats today, and I'm not, again, I, I hate genres, but, you know, I'm not necessarily talking about <laughs> jazz, but so many musicians today, because of this propensity of home studios and technology, they're making album after album after album, and they actually never really get a chance to, to, you know, road test these songs on the bandstand. When with you guys, you start playing new material live, and then the song takes on a life of its own. Over, and, and then when you yeah, go like you said, then we take them in the studio. <laughs> exactly. And, and that's kind of a lost art form. And I, I, to me, that's the magic of, of the, this sort of community this this music that we talked about is just the idea of letting the songs take on a life of their own yeah. uh, and then just going i mean how many you when you went in to record with horace i mean was it all first takes pretty much maybe a couple just to make sure and so maybe there was something but a lot of them like you say it was uh you can't do no more after the first take <laughs> that's right well i mean unless there's a major glitch but it's like um you know, and another thing, like I said, we had a chance to taste it and find out different, you know, ways of doing it before we went in the studio. We could play it, but we knew the we, you know, it's like you know the music, you know. And you sure. get a chance. I, you can get me to play one a tune that you got right there. All of a sudden, and this sound may be cool, but as I know the the song, the structure of it, and everything, the better it sound, you know. It, with song from my father, do you remember when you guys were first playing it? Like, did it was it did it have any resemblance to what wound up being iconically recorded on Blue Note? No, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> Straight ahead, man. We yeah. did it. Yeah. We did it at Berlin. Then we went to the studio and recorded. That was it. Oh you my! Know? This is yeah. you were so you were at Ber So did you? You were <laughs> with Horace. Were you? Traveling? Did you? Did you? Was that the first time you went across the country, or were you guys just doing the Northeast corridor, or what kind of traveling were you doing? Um, uh, boy, I can't remember. I, I know we didn't go to Europe that first year. I don't think. Do you think you went to California? Was that the first time you went to the West Coast, or you maybe didn't? Oh yeah, we yeah yeah we went to the West Coast. Well, yeah, with Horse Silver, right? Wow. Right, went there also, also uh, like with Stanley Turnton, but with Horse Silver, I think that's the first time I went to the west, to the west coast, and man, you know, and, and like, let me see, up in D.C. with the the jazz joint, I got a picture on my wall. Yeah, no, I, um, I should know, the Bohemian Caverns. Yeah, yes, man, that was such a nice place too. <laughs> yeah. Bohemian Caverns. yeah, that's where Ramsey <laughs> cut the, the Ramsey cut the it the uh, at his. Uh, his 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 ma famous tune at the, the In Crowd. That's where he recorded. Okay. It. Yeah. Okay. So you yeah. went you went to the Bohemian Caverns. You'd play like the Earl Theater in Philly. Like, can you talk a little the Howard Theater in, in D.C.? I mean, to me, this is like the the most scintillating stuff because that was like well, the, the only thing about the, uh, Jacob. I have another thing that I have to. Um, okay to do because I promised the people that I would do this and I wouldn't realize and I forgot about our interview. I'm so sorry, man. Well, do you um, want, can we, can we, can we continue this later or something, maybe tomorrow or something? Oh, that thing. What about tomorrow? Tomorrow's great, man. How about, uh, you want to try to do, how about 5 PM, uh, Eastern time tomorrow? Does that work? 5 PM. Okay. And how long would this take? <laughs> Uh, maybe, maybe another 30, 40 minutes. 
That'd be good. I don't know why I said that because I have somebody coming by tomorrow and we're putting our small big band together for our Christmas stuff in uh, December, okay? Yeah, throw the, you know, but you know, you know it's, don't so, worry about it. Just throw the, throw the charts away, man. You don't need charts. Nobody needs charts, all right? <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk to you tomorrow, hey, well, man. Here comes Santa Claus. You need a chart. On it. <laughs> all right, anyway, man. We'll, we'll, tomorrow, you said what time? 5 p.m. Uh, in Pittsburgh. Dynamite. All right, okay. baby. Be cool, man. I'm barking on my calendar right now. All right. Okay. Thank Talk you, brother. To you then. Bye. 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 Welcome back to the Jake Feinberg Show. It's an honor to bring back an amazing drummer and a great mentor, Roger Humphreys. Welcome back. Well, thank you very much, man, for having me. Can you talk a little bit about, um, how, I think it's a lost art in all types of music, but ultimately, when you were playing with Stanley, uh, can you talk about, like, how you learn to feather the bass drum. I think in in a lot of modern music today, including jazz, there's this uh, over-reliance <clears throat> on the bass drum and uh, less significance uh, of playing time on the cymbals. And I kind of wanted you to just talk about, you know, what those guys were looking for in terms of feathering on the bass drum. Well, I would just... Uh... It's a style that we play, man. You know, you, you accent the bass drum. I mean, I don't know when you say feathered. I guess you're talking about the way we was touching it, you know. Exactly. And and But that's come from not just these guys here. Any, it's come from a style that you pick up to learn how to control the bass drum. That's in the individual. Right. I'm just talking about keeping time. I mean, ultimately, like... A lot of the bass drum on a lot of the records, early records from the 50s, it's, you can barely even hear it. And there was, a, I just wanted you to talk about the, ultimately keeping time uh, on other parts of the kit, not necessarily on the bass drums. A lot of times today, the, the bass drum uh, kind of sounds like machine gun fire. Uh, it's well, very. Well, and the thing about it, you're talking the bass drum. Most of the guys that I, I know, including myself, it just put it for me, I am keeping the time with my cymbal and a snare drum and accenting with my bass drum. I don't have no pedal like doom, 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 you know, where you can hear that. <clears throat> no, it's for my different accenting, but I want to hit the accent. And my time is kept with the dynamic, you know, keeping the, 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 the volume under control, you know, with my cymbal. And like we come up as drummers, man, you accent different things. It ain't like you're going around when you're having a conversation. You talk loud all the time. You only talk <laughs> loud. You get excited. <laughs> the rest of the time, you're tipping your way through. So your ride cymbal patterns, can you just talk a little bit about like, especially when, I mean, Stanley was older than you, or would you say he was a, Stanley Turrentine was a peer of yours, or was he older than you? No, he, he, was, he was older than me. I mean, what did he want? What would he like? I mean, sometimes c cats would turn around to drummers and say, don't feed me so much. You're giving me too much information. Um, I'm just wondering well, what. See, I know, I, well, see, it all depends on the drummer and the person that they're playing with. You dig what I'm saying? I did. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But it all depends, like, uh, like I said, on, on the individual who are playing. You know, it's still, it's like having a conversation with someone. I speak about that all the time. And that's what it is when we're playing with uh, whoever the lead person is, the trumpet, the sax, whoever playing solo up front. It's like having a conversation with them. A lot of people think that, uh, you know, uh, people were go went from four on the floor to uh, uh, basically the idea was that... Um, when you did you what was the hardest thing that in your mind uh was what was what was the hardest thing you had to do uh in a live context i i have to believe that a lot of the venues that you were playing at uh maybe were the chitlin circuit uh they were antiquated public address systems um you know there was not a lot of you ne you couldn't really necessarily always hear yourself and i just wonder what you tr how your ears grew the most when you were in those early road experiences because you didn't have in ear monitors you didn't have state of the art uh, um, 
speaker systems, and quite frankly, sometimes the bass was, I mean, the upright bass wasn't even mic'd. And I just wanted you to talk a little bit about, you know, what was the biggest challenge for you in terms of holding everything down and, and making things feel smooth, as we talked about? Well, it was just like playing my part. It wasn't really a big challenge of the thing. We, I come up playing this way, you know, with sometimes you didn't have the all the acoustic, having a, 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 a speaker right beside your leg and all this, you know. We didn't come up with all that, man. You know, and you learn how to play from the, you know, from the dynamics of the room, you know? No. <clears throat> you learn how to play and control for, like, you hear the bass player behind you, you hear the piano player, and you play, once again, with dynamic, you know? Well, can you talk about when you, like, I would assume that Shirley Scott was on tour with you with Stanley? I mean, that there was no bass player, so how, how did your ears grow the most on the bandstand when you had to learn... Uh, to listen to her bass pedals. I mean, I I know what you're saying. That's how you came up playing. But I mean, you know, to to younger generations, it, this is incredibly important. And like you said, I think we talked about Max Roach and these cats. These guys were painting on the drums, man. I mean, they were painting. And I, that's really what I want you to talk about is that you know that ability. I know you came up playing that way. But like for yeah. instance, you know, with Shirley, how did you even hear the bass lines? You mean with her playing the bass line? Yeah, I mean there was no traditional. Easy man, easy. <laughs> it come up easy. You just listen to her playing the the piano part, you know, the organ part, and the bass line. It was it was no. You'd have to have something wrong with your ear if you couldn't hear that. I'm telling you, you know, this is all part of it. Well, but I just, I, when I when I interviewed Harold Jones, you probably know Harold well, you know, Tony Bennett's uh -huh. drummer, Basie's drummer. I mean, he talked about, in Chicago, um, playing with an organ player and a guitar player. Both of them had amplification, and he didn't. So, basically, he had to generate sound through soul and... I mean, I, I'm curious about that. That that maybe is the better question, is when you're dealing with instruments that that are amplified back when and you weren't, to the ability to generate sonic expansion through soul. You didn't have any amplification on the drum set, so you had to do that through soul. Yeah, but it never bothered me. It never, I never questioned that though. Uh, I mean, I never questioned that. I could hear Stanley and Shirley very well. I never had no problem like listening to them or hearing Shirley the bass line any of that. I dig. Um, was there a studio scene in Pittsburgh? Uh, like you know, obviously Mr. Rogers was going on there. Were you part of the jingle scene? Did you do commercials there? Uh, I'm just curious. No. Uh -uh. What about? No. Okay, so um, ultimately. Uh, when did you first, you basically spent your entire career with, with the exception of being in the studio with Horace and different dates, you were not a studio shark. So you were a touring musician for most of your career. Uh -huh. is, that, is that fair to say? Well, you go to the studio when you have to, but when everybody, I don't know, but so many guys who were in the studio, you know what I mean? Um, the, you know, like with mounds and, you know, uh, with different, with, you know, uh, Art Blake in the van and, and different ones. Um, this is something that, you know, I'm really don't even think about. <laughs> well, we I mean, but I mean, you're, you're studio. just getting, yeah, I mean, but this is the Jake Feinberg show and, and this is stuff that is absolutely, I'm just curious about the idea of, being able to sing for your supper as a road dog musician. You know, for instance, Ray Charles, you started with him in what year? Uh, 68. And you... Ray Charles. Ray Charles in 68. Now, did... And how long did that engagement last for? It lasted like a year. Uh, you said a year? Mm-hmm. Right. <clears throat> so, during the 70s, I'm just curious, what, uh, what, were, what did you do... Primarily, were you playing locally? I'm trying to, because I don't... Cause... Oh, yeah. Yeah, I played Richard Groove Holmes. 
after Ray Charles, uh, Clem and Richard grew home. We were traveling, went to Europe and came back. This, you know, it, it didn't stop like that, you know. We, and then after we, Richard grew home back in, in the 70s and that, 1972 is when I started my band, Orange Factor. Orange Fact. I do have never heard of that band. R.H. Factor. R.H. So, 72. My, my band, what they get, my, my band, R.H. Factor, is before my band, uh, Roy Hargrove. Oh, my God. Wait a minute. My band started back in 1972 when I had R.H. Factor. Okay, so you explained, now, who was in that in that band? Who was in that band? It was like, uh, boy, a bunch of guys. George Green, first of all, was a saxophone player here. And then a young man, a buddy of mine, Dan Donahue. And then I had like, um, let me see. Keith Stebler was on the keyboards, and uh, my man, a, f- a very good friend of mine, Mike Taylor, who passed away. Wow. So can you talk, yeah. and you guys, did you ever get in the studio and record an album in the early 70s, or when was, did you? No, no, I didn't, no, I didn't record anything with Dory. In fact, the band in 1970. What, what was, I mean, I guess, what was the the uh, type of music, would you say, was... Jazz played is what I come up on. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, but no, but I mean, one. like, I'm that was... The style. I dig. No, I I, uh, I mean, but you're talking, that's the exact period of time when, um, you know, you had the beginnings of Weather Report and you had Return to Forever. Was it, were you doing more acoustic bop, bebop jazz, or were you actually going into more fusion territory? No, not the fusion territory. We touch a little bit of that ground, but base of our basically is all bebop jazz, you know, and down, you know, and you know, it was basically like the bebop jazz. I did. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, just the cats that connected me with you, Angelo Versace and Joe Saylor. Um, I I know that Joe um, was very close, or it remains close to you today. Um, those cats, uh, grew up in rural, uh, Pennsylvania and they would come and play at the Crawford Grill. Um, and there'd be times where you'd be in the audience and, you know, if they had a good night, you know, you'd let them know. But if they had a clunker, uh, you know, you'd talk to them pretty directly about what they needed to work on. And I remember what Angelo told me, Angelo is now the head of the jazz department here at the University of Arizona in Tucson. And he said that <clears throat> it was the most emboldening thing because here you have this iconic drummer from this period of incredible music and improvisation and bo- musical vocabulary. And it was really the best kind of mentoring uh, because those car trips back to their hometown were very... <laughs> um, silent and a lot of contemplation and I just kind of wanted you to talk about um, you know the ability and why you continue why it's important to give back and how you think the best way for musicians uh, to give back in, in terms of like what kind of advice would you talk to kids about especially today I mean younger cats today a lot more temperamental I mean, John Hurd would sit in the square in Pittsburgh and people would be yelling at him, you need to sound more like Ray Brown. George Benson wasn't even allowed to sit in because he was a singer. Nobody respected his chops. It was a much tougher time. And even you said when you went to New York and saw all those cats trying out for Horace, they were all pretty good. So I'm just trying to get at the idea of how you try to approach younger cats today uh, and the kind of feedback you give them so that they – you know, they know what they need to work on, but they're still willing to get back on the bandstand. Well, same way like I came up, you got to listen. got to listen to a variety of uh, uh, drummers. And uh, the ones that we notice out here doing, you know, doing everything and grabbing your attention, that's who you got to, those are the ones that you got to, you know, listen to playing with the uh, the big name Guys who, uh, like I said once again, you talk about Horace Silver back in the day, Miles Davis, and, and and a bunch of others. 
Um, I just tell them all the time, man, you just got to make sure you keep listening, listen to other drummers and making sure you practice. And now, you know, no reason that you can't, if you can, just try to make sure you've been able to read, to understand what somebody's telling you, you know, to play and how to play it, you dig it, and be able to uh, read their music, the chart, their song, you know. Because it was a different time, man. I came up, even though a lot of the guys had a chance to go to school and study. But right now, it may not be as easy because all depends on your location, who, who who you're dealing with. But if you're out, if you're you're on the road, you can just keep on studying now because uh, they got places for you to pick up some books <laughs> and look at them. You know, reading books, man, don't make you a drummer or anything like that. But it just try to help you to understand, like, what somebody's talking about, the first five bars, you know, and then uh, do the pickup, which may be eighth note, put up, boot up. You know, and most all of the young guys now, dig this, are getting that because they're studying. A lot of them is going to school studying, and then they're coming out and playing, you know, with bands. But that's the best thing I can give you right now is to... Uh, for for the education of drumming is to follow the is, is to follow the the drummers who are out here and and be make friends with people you know you get more out of that you get more conversation out of the guys if they're not afraid of you trying to you know be scared of them or what have you <clears throat> do you uh you know you could put on any blue note record uh song from my father any record with Mickey Roker uh, any record with Al Harewood, uh, Max Roach, everybody, every drummer from your time period had their own individual sound. Obviously you had mentors and people you looked up to, but there's a huge homogenization of sound today in modern jazz, Roger. I can't tell who anybody is. And I, and I just, I, I really have to ask you, I mean, what is, if you were talking to younger cats today, I mean, is it possible to put in to b push blues and jazz into the academy and if so i mean aren't you just going to wind up sounding like your professor mm, <laughs> no because no matter what i've heard max and r blakey play i take their concept but you ain't gonna really sound like a unless you're trying to really imitate somebody, then you won't have your own identity. You just be taking small things from them. Like I said, that press roll from Art Blakey. The rest of the stuff you be, you know, uh, create, trying to create and make it for yourself because ain't nobody going to sound exactly like Max or anybody else, you know, no matter what, you know, or Art Blakey. My man, uh, uh, the young drummer who just passed away, mm. he was Art student man, I mean... Boy. I'm trying to block. Why am I blanking on that? This, mm. this yeah, he just passed. He he went. He came and he traveled all over the place. But he was one of uh, Art's like young mentors. Okay. Okay. Mm. Anyway, so uh, like I said, no matter what you do, you're not going to sound exactly like Roger. <laughs> you may pick up some things, you know, take a few things that Roger played, how he tried, how he played it, and maybe sound set the phrasing. They say, oh, yeah, Roger played it. I played like that. You know, he played like that. <laughs> but it ain't going to be the same. <laughs> Did you get to ever play or get to know John Coltrane at all? Yeah, I met John Coltrane. Never played with him. Mm -mm. Can you talk about him as a man? I mean, that dude was an elven, too, well, for that. That part I can't. That part I can't describe to you because when I was around John, he's very quiet. Mm -hmm. He didn't have that much to say. And this maybe he's talking a horn so or somebody, but he still didn't have that much to say that I remember. Oh, no, you know? he always had his horn in his mouth. Absolutely. Right, because yeah. like at the time he came to Crawford Grill, he played up on a bandstand and they took a break. He went downstairs to the dressing room. He was playing down there and come back upstairs again and still got on the bandstand and playing again. <laughs> That's exactly you know? what he did at the Apollo. He did that everywhere, man. Yes, he continued <laughs> to play. One good thing about it, he had to worry about talking to nobody. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, just the dedication to the craft. What about, um, what about Elvin? Did you get a chance to hang with him? Not to hang with him. I met him. 
but not to hang with them because, like, these guys are all gone busy, man. They're a little bit older than me. You dig know what I'm saying? I did. And not that that really mattered, but they had their own thing. You know, when you get a certain age, man, that you be dealing with your boys. But Elvis wasn't around that much, man. Elvis was on the road. When he was on the road, I guess he was home with, you know, with the family. Absolutely. I mean, who who would you say um, were your compatriots? I mean, you know, in that era, I'm just thinking about, you mentioned Roy Brooks and people like that. I mean, Roy was from Detroit. Um, but you, you really have basically lived in Pittsburgh your whole life. I mean, you never moved to L.A. You never moved to New York. Well, the thing about it, New York, I had relatives there. So while I was being on the road, like with uh, with, with, with Stanley Turrentine, I'd be up at seven seven zero Saint Nicholas Avenue up in Harlem, where my family lived. Oh boy! And now, then, see, now we're getting same, somewhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. That to me is magical, Roger. I mean, can you that the, can you talk to the audience about what the Harlem was like? Uh, you know, m- m- uh, monks, all the clubs. And just sort of the the culture being out on the street, I cannot believe that your family lived in Harlem. Oh yeah, uh, my uncle, my uncle, aunt, they live in, in Harlem. What was nice about uh, in Harlem, man, there was so many, uh, so many clubs, you know. And, and it's hard for me to even remember to mention uh, the places that we played at. Misty, I think Misty Lounge. Yeah, or, cl- oh, like Club <laughs> Baby Grand or something, maybe or. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, because I played at Birdland, Apollo Theater. You played? Uh, did you play at Smalls Paradise? Yeah, there you go. Small <laughs> Smalls Paradise. Smalls, yeah. Yeah. You played yeah. there with like uh, with Grant Green, or was it always with or with Doc? Yeah, when I was playing most of my stuff was in New York, but with Horace Silver. Right. So, like with Horace, I mean, that was the thing I wanted to ask you about too. Was um, with with Stanley? Would you guys rent a Hearst? and put Shirley's organ back there? How, how did you guys travel? So, uh, like I said, put a trailer on the back of it when we, had, when we left from uh, New York to go to California. We came through Pittsburgh and then uh, say, you know, to my family and Stanley family. And we kept on going, man, all the way. We drove all the way to uh, Los Angeles. And that, was a, that was a heck of a drive. Were there... But we stopped in Chicago. Wait a minute. Yeah. We stopped in Chicago... And maybe in Detroit, you know how you hit different places on your way going somewhere. I can't remember all of them, but uh, we stopped in a couple of places on the way out. Right. Um, was it? What was the? Um, were there certain towns that you didn't could not stop in because of the uh, segregation? I just know that with like Chico's band, Chico Hamilton was driving across the country. You'd have to send. The white cats in to get sandwiches from a deli, and they couldn't go in. Did you? Did you? Did you have any problems with? Yeah, it, it was still the same. It was still the same. We was in Mississippi. I would in Mississippi with Ray Charles. Hell, you talking about sixty eight? Wow. And we had to stay at a, a black residence. You know, I mean, we didn't stay at the hotel. I'll put it that way. <clears throat> and Ray had to stay with you guys in the black residence as well. No, Ray didn't stay with us. Uh, oh, the band uh, had to. Yeah, yeah, right. Did you did you know John Hurd, by the way? John Hurd, yes, I knew John Hurd. He grew up. I grew up with with John, and he's a little older than me, but he held a bass player, and I played with him. You did because because we lo- we lost John. He was a dear friend. He also like made these incredible busts of all Duke and all these cats, but. The, that, that and he was good with his artwork, also unbelievable, and and an, I mean, really, an incredible. Upright mm-hmm. player. What about Booker Irvin? Booker Irvin, I didn't know him. You know, I might have seen him, but I, I didn't know him. <clears throat> um, After that, mm-hmm. You know, before I let you go, Roger, I just, I kind of wanted you to just talk about your concept of love and how you bring, you know, how you stay inspired to inspire others because we're, you know, for a whole bunch of reasons you know, as a, as a world, the world is on fire. Um, and you know, we're, we're dealing with a lot of, a lot of, uh, dissidents and cognitive dissidents and corruption and, um, and people are falling for it. Uh, millions of people are really 
falling for it. And, you know, at this point, the only thing that I know how to do is to continue to try to inspire other people to be themselves. And I kind of just wanted you to talk about your concept of love. Oh, my concept of love is what was given to me ever since I I was here, since I was on earth. You dig it? And part of that, man, uh, how I got that foundation of love, I was raised in the church. I went to, you know, as a kid, you go to Sunday school as a kid, and you keep going up the ladder when you're a teenager, but your life is spent around people who speak of love and speak of God. It is. And um, as always, you know, and you got to keep the faith, you know, just like going through everything that you go through. And I keep the faith and never knew that this would happen for me to be called to do a, leg a legacy award thing would happen for me, you know. <clears throat> and it's the people that you're around that help you to, you know, keep this love within you. Even though it's got to be within you, within you, and not nobody else. Other, it's nice when other people have that, mm -hmm. but you got to have it for yourself so you can spread the love. And I try to do that with all my students, all the young people that I meet. That's because I have faith in my Father in Heaven. I'm not trying to, you know, talk down about that person, that person. We're all individuals. And if uh, you don't have the love, man, I, I don't, you know, it's, it's something really missing in some people's life because they don't have love. They don't have people loving them and they don't feel love, you know, and that's got to be a one-on-one -on -one thing but inside you, you know, love. That's beautiful, man. I mean, did you, did you go to a sanctified church? Uh, I'm just curious about it's like... It's a Baptist Baptist church. Baptist church. So, I mean, were there people falling out of the pews? Uh, I, I'm just curious. Yeah. Like, were there holy no. rollers in there? No. Well, you know, people get excited. They get the feeling about uh, the spirit. Yeah, they love to fall down in the seat. They shout, you know. And that's a one-on-one -on -one thing, spirit, that they got. It may not hit you, you know, but it hit them. And that's, and that's how they express themselves. What was the okay, name? Of, so that was the kind of church that you, what was the name of the church you went to? Metropolitan. Metropolitan Baptist Church. And Wasn't that far from where I lived at even. And, and, and who was the pastor there? Oh man, it's, uh, we can't, we can't go, who was the pastor there at that time? Yeah. I should sure remember his name, but, um. You know what it is? I just wonder because, like, down in New Orleans, uh, Melvin Lasty had the last spirit church in New Orleans. He actually had a, a trap set on the stage. I mean, that's the, they were playing. I'm, I'm curious about the rhythms coming out of that church. Jabo Starks and Clyde Stubblefield, who you probably met and hung out, you know, James Brown's drummers, they came from the church but it was a lot of hand clapping and the older gentlemen had sticks and they weren't necessarily clapping on two and four it could be three and four and then there were tambourines and i'm just like aside from the one i get what you're saying about the one-on-one -on -one connection to the spirit but could you talk as we wrap up here just the rhythms of the church uh because to me that has everything to do with the soul jazz and that kind of beautiful music that you played with Stanley and Horace? Well, uh, let me see. I tell you what, I have two sisters who sang in the choir. And I had three sisters that sang in the choir. And I had a brother who sang in the choir. And an older brother who sang in the choir. A lot of my family was in the church. I mean, you know, choir singing. In, 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 in the choir. Also, my wife even sang in the choir. I sang in the choir for a little bit until I got too busy, you know what I mean? Yes. So uh, we, we we all got the, the background, you know what I mean? The love. <clears throat> and that thing has to be within you, not just at the church. Church should help you do because they represent the love. But if you don't have it within inside you, man, you know what I mean? No, uh, I did. I did. But, but was there any... Was I mean, because singing is one thing, but uh, w a lot of people looked at rhythm and the blues as the devil's music. Is, is that the way the, the church approached uh, that music? Were there tambourines? Was there, was there sticks? Oh, yeah. Yeah, a couple of people had cat, 
tam- tambourine. And you're right, they clap, man. They have rhythm in the hand when they be singing the song, you know. You know, so uh, yeah. See, this is this is hard for me to express because it's just something that we did. You know what I mean? Hey, man, and, I'm with you. Know what and, it is? It's it's so important. I'm with you. I know. I I mean, I know it's hard to actually put it into words. But yeah, many, I mean, I've done 1,800 interviews, and and all the cats, all your peers and older, have been able to pull it off. So I, I, you know, I appreciate you. I know you're busy. Um, I, uh, I look forward to connecting you down the road, and when you have a little more time, we could do maybe another part. But um, this, this, this is good for now, brother. I thank you, man. Yeah, man. I thank you with with all the stuff that I've been going for the the legacy. I just come back from doing the thing for a brunching for in the neighborhood. You dig it? It just been so many things on my head, and until I guess it, it's just hard to get into all the all of the details. You know, all the questions that you ask me. But I appreciate you, man, even calling me. You hey, know, man, you know what, dude? This. You know what I care about is that after this call. You know, you'll be thinking about some stuff because I stirred it up inside of you, and that's the soul, that's the spirit, right there, man. So, much love to you, Roger, and uh, and uh, congratulations on everything, brother. Hey, thank you so very much, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, be thank cool. You. Yeah, later. All right, bye, bye, bye. bye.